Oh. I'm put my hip out. Oh. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you'll be pleased to hear that's probably as lively as we will get. Basically just to get our hearts going, you understand? Because we don't get out much these days. Now, I am Ray McCurlane, and this... I am uh, Don McCracken. <laughs> Don Mackie Chan. Sorry. Doon McKeechan. <laughs> Doon McKeechan. Oh my goodness. So, I grew up... So, I was born in London. We moved to suburbia. And then my dad got a job in Scotland and decided a bit to be a bit like the good life. They wanted to go and live and have geese and chickens and pigs and live without any, like, ever going to the shops. So I was sent to the local secondary school, but I had a little piping posh voice. And um, it was quite a rough secondary school, so I used to hide in the toilets at, at break time. And, uh, and there was one girl I remember called Anne Cameron who used to throw up my skirt and go, let's get a look at your bloomers. <laughs> Put me in these purple bloomers to keep me warm, because it was freezing up there. Freezing! And um, I think just sort of doing impressions of Basil Fawlty or Sybil Fawlty slightly saved my life because I was quite scared. I did get beaten up a few times and I just used to just pull something out of the bag and use comedy to stop, you know, that happening. So then I joined the drama group, which was really good, age 12, and played basically English bitches. So that was <laughs> great and they loved it. So me being able to do a Scottish, uh, an English accent because the school I went at seemed to universally hate English people. <laughs> the, the history lessons were like, and the English came and um, raped her women and raised her fields to the ground and took her cattle and... Uh, and I'd be like, can I go to the toilet, please? <laughs> May I please go to the toilet? <laughs> and they'd be like, where do you stay? And I'd be like, I, I don't stay anywhere. I, I live in Upper Lago. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was dead meat from day one. So, yeah, I think being... being um, being able to join the drama group, so then when I when I moved to London, when I went past uni, I um, I started doing stand up comedy at um, at university and got sort of recognised and put into my first telly from someone seeing me in a pub. So that's the beginnings. If any of us get too boring, um, we'll do this. <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, I always wanted to be an actress when I was little, and I uh, auditioned secretly to my very, very Catholic and quite staid parents for the part of Alice in Wonderland, which was being performed by the Bletchco Players. And I was not allowed to go to the Bletchco Players because my mum felt that they drank, <laughs> and they smoked reefers, <laughs> and they got off with each other. <laughs> And she didn't think that was right for an 11-year-old girl. <laughs> so whilst I got the part of Alice in Wonderland, I was not allowed to play it. So I have a little puppy that is going a bit bonkers. So I might just let her sit up here. Oh. Oh. No, 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 she's fine up there. Let her fall off the stage. That's show business, isn't it? <laughs> she's got to learn. There, up here. Really. Well, that's not me. fair. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Full oh, focus, Dolly. Yeah. So yes, then I went to drama school, and then in the olden days, I don't know if you remember, you had to get an equity card. This sounds like anathema now, yeah, doesn't yeah. it? Because everybody from Towie or Big Brother just goes straight into Macbeth or Hamlet. But in the olden days, you had to get an equity card. So I remember auditioning for a Norwegian cruise. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, really, Norway. Uh, they, um, they did a sort of medley of the shows that were on in London. So I had to, on a Norwegian cruise, and it was quite rocky, sing, this was my song, my big number. Tits and ass, got myself a fancy pair. Tighten up the derriere, did the nose with it, all the girls with it. It's a gas, had the bingo bongos done. <laughs> was a little bit higher in those days since smoking cats in full strength for most of my life. I, um, so that's how I went to drama school and then we met each other. Yes, I got my equity card operating a follow spot for a 
tour of, yeah, a really bad tour of London with the GLC. But anyway, there we are. Six weeks of hell. Greater London Council, for those people who can't remember that part. Ken <laughs> Livingston. Um, when you worked on Smacky Pony, how did you divide the sketches? This is from Sue. Oh, um, so yes, that was quite tricky actually because it was with Fiona Allen. Yes, yeah, so there were three women and a female producer and a director who was female, and often two script editors who weren't always female, but writers in the room. And what we would tend to do is we would rewrite. So we would get a sketch that had been written, obviously for. Um, uh, Griff, Mel and Griff, but been sort of, so we would get a sketch and they would cross out the men's names and just put the women's names, but it would never work, it would be two bomb disposal experts or something, it would be very male. So we would re-improvise it pretty much for the whole day and make the straight man the funny man and we would change everything around, make it more interesting. And whoever improvised it might then get a bit beady because someone else might be given that role because they would do it better. So it was a very, it was, it was, would you say it was like the sisterhood do? What, what was the sisterhood? I mean, did you, did you get cross with each other if you got a sketch or somebody else got a sketch? Not really, you? because I, I was always good at, strangely, doing bossy characters. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how, how, how ever did that happen. How did that happen? And Sally was a bit more good at doing the sort of um, ditzy, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. And, but sometimes Fiona and I would be similar yeah. and, and, um, physically, I found it easier to do comedy and make the crap of myself physically than Fiona did. So I would often get the more physical comedy. So often if it wasn't spoken, I'd be happiest. If it was just a quickie of me having to lap dance a, a sort of lamppost or something, that, that's definitely going to be my job. <laughs> or anything to do with falling on my face in water would also be mine. Anything to do with getting dirty or anything to do with water... So most of the physical comedy was given I've to me. I've seen you doing the lap dancing in the old town, actually. <laughs> most Saturday night. I'm sure you'll be there later. <laughs> okay, Tit or not. Tit or not. So, we first met on the comedy circuit back in the 80s. True that. Um, tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> if only she really wanted to know. I do want to know, because I remember bits of it. Well, we first met, you were in a comedy double act called Rabbit and Dune. That's right. And I think you were doing quite militant sketches. Militant, yes. In those days. Um, I mean, we could do you some of our material, but it's really mainly about the miners' strike. And Thatcher. <laughs> and um, sexual green of commerce. When I left drama school, instead of waiting around to be a tomato in an advert, I decided to, uh, to just write myself some material, which is kind of what you did. Yeah, I think in the 80s it was really interesting because it was less rock and roll comedy, so you literally could write something in your kitchen and go and perform it in a pub that night, even if you were reading off a piece of paper. Whereas then it suddenly sort of exploded into something much more rock and roll, and it was bigger clubs like jonglers. But in the old days, I first saw you on the door... Um, your boyfriend at the time was, run, was running a tiny little club. It was our, almost our favourite gig to play. And um, you could just go and experiment with what you were doing. So you could just write something that day, and that gave you great creative, you know... It was people, leeway. really. The comedy circuit was people with a lot of folk who... There was a man who was called the Ice Sculpture Man who would literally bring on a massive block of ice and then just sculpt it over a period of 20 minutes tear paper. into yeah. something. It's a bit more variety. Right, right. I think a lot of people on the circuit those days possibly suffered mental illness. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas now it's a bit more, here's a guy. Bang bang, there's yeah, a bear, bang, yeah. Bang, bang. It was a bit more like I suppose like poetry jam or might be now that people would go and try something out and if it failed, no one really cared. So it was, you were, it was more of an ability to fail. There was less money involved. It was less big business. And as it got bigger, we all went to Edinburgh. We got agents. We got managers. We then were doing gigs for like five hundred pounds, which felt like you know a hundred grand in those days. And so it was a bit more. It became suddenly more. Still does. Yeah. <laughs> became more commercial, I suppose. Now. Let's just talk about um, your national theatre experience recently. I know a couple of people have put questions in. Uh, you just played Feste, an all-women version, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. No. No. I made a mistake. No, not all-women. <laughs> Basically, it was, we allowed some men to be in it. No, Tamsin Greg played uh, Malvolia instead of Malvolio, and I played Feste. So two <coughs> main parts were played by women that should have been normally played by men, but the rest were um, a mix. 
But I remember you coming down to the beach hut when you'd just been to audition for that. Yes. And you had to go audition it with a song, and I think we should have your audition. <laughs> yeah. Because, oh no, it's a, it's a combo of oh, things. things that do I had just to moved, okay, I just moved to the old town, literally a year ago, properly moved here. I've been coming here for 10 years, renting. And I just moved, and the day after it was like, you've got an audition at the National. I was like, oh God, you can't really say no, it's a good place to work. And as a director I knew, so I didn't prepare anything. So could you prepare two scenes? Um, or two scenes, and could we have two songs? <laughs> so I was just moving house. I was just doing boxes, and you know. And then I got on the train that morning. I thought I better think of something now. I better, better read it. I better read it on the train. So I read it, and I found a little tiny bit that I thought was really nice. And I tried to learn it, and I couldn't. So I wrote it down on a piece of paper. <laughs> it was only about four lines. And then I got into the audition, and we had a chat. And he said, right, so what's the scene you've prepared? I said, I've got some lines, a couple of lines. That I, and then I couldn't remember them, so I had to get the paper out and read them, which I read them rather well. And then he went, right, so what are you going to sing for us today? And I had absolutely no idea, because I haven't ever sung properly in public. So I started singing a folk tune. We have I am it. a poor wayfaring stranger <laughs> Wandering through this world of woe And I carried on in this and I thought this was getting a bit boring <laughs> So then I just busted into a bit of grime So I went, too many men, too many, many men Too many men, too many, many men We need some more girls in here We need some more girls in here And then I went, ooh, well, ooh, well. And I got the job yeah, that's how I got onto the Olivier stage. What is Graham Norton really like? <laughs> yeah. There's a question. Well, obviously, he saw a gap in the market that there weren't many gay men around. Graham and I have been happily married for 25 years. We have two children at university, Bramwell and Olivia, um, and we're very happily married. No, he is, I would say, for all those people that think he must have a horrible side, he's almost entirely the same, but not quite so full on, because he would be annoying in real life if he was quite so... <laughs> so he's the same sort of person, but maybe down by about 20 notches, because we first met on a programme that you may remember... <laughs> Um, called Carnal Knowledge, which um, we co-presented, and it was basically like Mr. and Mrs., but with sex problems. So, yes, yes, I remember the, the Daily Mail did say that these people should be killed um, for, uh, for doing this terrible, terrible programme. But we met on that, and we did about 20 shows in, you know, five days, and have been very good friends ever since. So he's a very, very nice chap. Uh, I've got to say that because he's quite wealthy as well. <laughs> um, but no, he is exactly as you would expect him to be. Um, apart from, I remember both his father and my father had recently died, both had Parkinson's disease, and we were comparing notes. And we were in a quite a posh restaurant in London, and we were both sort of on the point of tears, just sort of talking about this terrible thing. And someone came over to the table and said, very drunkenly, it's my wife's birthday, do you mind signing her tits? <laughs> <laughs> and of course the easiest thing to do is just to say yes. Because if you say no when someone is drunk, I, actually I'm having a private conversation, we're crying because our fathers have just died. They go, oh, we're not good enough for you, are we? So, so he dutifully did get a Sharpie pen and signed her rather voluptuous bosom. Best wishes, Graham, Jordan. And they passed off and we went back to her crying. Um, so sometimes fame does have quite a, a price to pay. <laughs> But um, generally, he's very, very nice. When you problem solve on the radio with Graham, do oh, yeah. you spend much time discussing beforehand? When I problem solve? Mm. When you're on the radio, do you spend much time discussing beforehand about the, about the problem, or do you do it sort of no. improv? No, no. Graham comes in about ten minutes before the show starts. Um, 
he gets given a book of the guest that he's interviewing about the book, and he looks at the front cover and he looks at the back and then says, that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> and then invariably, while there's a, a track on, during uh, the interview, he'll be reading a little bit of the book. <laughs> so he kind of familiarizes himself. But with the problems, no. We kind of know each other so well now that it's best not to just yeah. do it, just to keep going straight through. Oh, I suppose when I did stand up in the 80s, there was the uh, obligatory get your tits out the minute you walked on stage as a woman. There was almost worse than that was the sort of terrible silence as you'd walk out, because there'd be like four, four men on, and then you might come on on an evening. And they'd be like, oh, God, no. <laughs> that's really, really bad. So there was just that general deflation that you had to get over before you could then try and be funny. So I suppose that's a, a kind of ingrained sexism, sexism. But I think what was interesting was with Smack the Pony, we'd all spent about eight years being what I would call feeds to other men's careers. So me and Sally and Fiona had all been involved with... Um, Griff Reese Jones or Steve Coogan or even in the day to day although that's not the same but we'd all been teachers we'd all been uh, nurses we'd been secretaries we'd never been the comedy we'd been the feeds mm. and the same in Five Alive I remember, I remember Brian Conley saying to me oh you're a really good feed you're a really good <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. it was the same with the fast show really yes. it was all men that, that really made the fast show and had all the catchphrases None of the women really, apart from Arabella, had one with my bum look big in this. Um, it really had to, you'd be saying, coming on with a sort of white coat and a stethoscope, saying, the doctor will see you now. Yes. Um, and I think, I, I seem to remember Arabella Weir wrote a sketch called Different With Boys, where there was a really high-powered woman saying, yes, America, sell, Japan, buy, I'll see him tomorrow, and if he's not here in my office. And then a man comes in the door, and she goes, Hello. <laughs> Have you been given a cup of tea? <laughs> and I think there are a lot of those kind of behaviours that you get. But it's changing all the time. The problem is that a lot of the tabloids kind of won't let women escape. Because I've seen, and I kind of did a, a, a check on this, you know the circle of shame on women where they take a photograph of Jerry Hall looking a bit haggard or something because she used to be a supermodel. So if you go through your entire body as a, a, a woman, they say, you know, oh, crow's feet, lemon lips. I've seen all these rings of shame around someone. Lemon lips, turkey neck we've had as well. And then you get... Sagging knees. Crepey... Dry ankles. Crepey yes. there. No, then you get muffin tops, you get back fat, you get crepey decollete, yeah, yeah. you get cankles. And I was happened to be in Australia with Nigella Lawson when she wore a burkini, um, which you know made the front page of the Telegraph go bigger. Uh, but it was because she doesn't keep she doesn't go into the sun, which is why she only looks about twenty and she's nearly sixty. But then when they couldn't get any more pictures because those pictures sell for so much money because people like to scrutinise and go, oh yeah, she has got back fat. Um, when, they, when they couldn't get any more pictures of her, obviously she was going to wear the bikini again, that didn't go well the first time, she actually offered one to me, do you want to wear it? And I said, no, 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 thank you. Um, but we went out finally for supper, she was coaxed out and the paparazzi were all outside. They finally took a picture of her bunion, <laughs> which then appeared on the second page of the Daily Mail. Nigella's agony, her bunion is blighting her life. <laughs> so that is kind of, you know, the sexism continues with things like that. But in, in work situations, I think people know now that they can't. And also, um, we will be starting to earn the same amount of money as the... Mm -hmm. Well, it's great that, there's, mm -hmm. that you suddenly see what people are earning. Mm -hmm. That is extraordinary, yes. a huge leap, because it is, it is kind of shaming people who are doing exactly the same job. And it happens in, it happens in sitcom, it happens in presenting, it happens in news reading, it happens in sport. You know, it's it's that's that's a good. <laughs> I could feel that I might just put my fist in the air and say my nickname is Millie Tan. So watch out! Fairly. Here's another question from Dennis and Tom. Dolly, sit down, or you will be killed. Um, do you ever get your ego shattered? Dennis and Tom. Ego shattered. 
I think auditions are hard when you, like that audition for the National was kind of okay because it was so bad that I went home on the train just wincing, but it wasn't, it was so bad that it was good. Whereas if you do one that's almost good, but a bit bad, and then you get that, what people do is they stand up and they go, thank you so much for coming in. <laughs> and it's basically, you haven't got the job, please leave quickly and efficiently through the door. And you think, oh, I've spent 35 years being rejected by, by uh, people like you. It can be, I offer, what I do is I go and buy a little present, a tiny, tiny thing, even if it's like a little bath bomb or something, just to go, it's all right, you've been rejected. Because most people don't get that amount of rejection in their lives. They might go for four, five job interviews in their life, or they might go, oh, I've lost my job, but I'm going to go back out. I'm gonna, um, that is our life pretty much every month. Or if, with voiceovers now, which used to be great bread and butter, you, you might have to audition now for a voiceover. And that's a bit humiliating, because you go, well, I used to do five a week, and now I'm going into going, please, can I have one? Mm -hmm. So there's certain things you just have to boost your own ego. Yeah, and the voiceovers, they, you do something like, I did one that was Pampers. Pamper your baby. And they say, yeah, yeah, it's all right, but can you just do a bit more on the your? Okay. Pampers. Pamper your baby. No, no, too much now. What about baby? Can you try baby? Pampers. Pamper your baby. No, no, that's wrong, that's wrong. Yeah. You go back to the, and you get that, and they keep you there for the entire hour yeah. with three words or four yeah. words that they just go, no. Maybe and they're, but they're behind glass, so there's a whole phalanx of very young people. <laughs> a bit like in, I don't know if anyone's seen Toast of London, yeah, but Clem yeah. Fandango. Clem <laughs> Fandango, can you hear me? Um, I, uh, when they forget to turn the talk back off from their side. <laughs> <laughs> can she, can she? Can she put a bit more of like a smile in her voice because she looks really like mealy mouth? Like <laughs> <laughs> and, and I go, yes, hi, yeah, my name's Dune, and I can, I can put a smile in my voice. I can, I can stir for this feminine. <laughs> 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 day and night, and then, but then the minute you take the piss, there's just this blank wall, and you know that the job is not yours. Sometimes it's good to walk out with dignity. We go, people, people, thank you very much. This has been a really enjoyable time, but I'm leaving now. So I've, I've only done that once in a voiceover and one, once in a very embarrassing sitcom, and it was Friday night dinner, and it was Tamsin Greg, and I was going up for a, for a, a, a guest lead, and she was a sort of fruity cougar. I always hate that. Fruity, she's a cougar. You know, she's like, Cougar. 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 That's anyway. why you didn't get it. Is there any way we can make this character a little bit more, um, less of an obvious stereotype of a old woman desperate for a young man? The face is sort of fell. And uh, he just kept making me do it again and again and again, till I but felt myself going very red, and I said, I'm, I'm going to go now, I'm going to go, and I dropped my bag, everything fell out of my bag all over the floor as I tried to make a very, you know, it was, it was a terrible moment, but they, that hasn't happened very often. I think the only time I prepared my ego check was not actually in a job. It was, I was doing a job with Caroline Quentin, her from Men Behaving Badly, and Nick Hancock, who used to present, what was it? Uh, so they think it's all over. Yeah. And we were in France, and we were just finished filming, and we were at a restaurant. And Caroline and I, buoying each other up, were flirting terribly with the waiters, uh, who were most attractive. Uh, they were most pleasing to the eye. And we'd had one or two vinos, and we were doing lots of sort of... <laughs> and sort of, you know, fluttering her eyelashes and little twinkly hands and twinkly laughter. And Nick Hancock said... You may think that you're doing coquettish behaviour and laughing like little Tinkerbell, but what they're hearing is... is it working in showbiz as you get older? Brackets, sorry. <laughs>
no, at certain, the parts you might get cast as suddenly you're playing grandma. Grandma? <laughs> Sorry, grandma. I'm playing grandma. But I couldn't I be the mother. But you're not even the girlfriend or the mum, you're the uh, grandma. Cousin Paul is often, he's 80 or something, and he's often <laughs> seen with a 25 year old who's meant to be a plausible um, love interest for him. Yeah. But I think that's why actresses get that. Um, reputation as being sort of lushes and slightly after the younger boys because you get cast as grandmas. Cougars. Cougars. <laughs> and you're trying to sort of redress the balance in your true life. But yes, it is harder, but I think you just have to stick with it. What else are you going to do? You know? But there's not, also there aren't as many good roles. So I know some very good older male actors who are just working a lot. And you think, wow, you've just you've got that job, and then you've got the next job, and then you've got the next job, because there are just more parts. So it, it, whether it's in plays or telly, or there just aren't as many roles. It's simply that. So we need more female screenwriters, and we need more people creating not just like all women shows, so it's sort of ghettoised, but just a bit more across the board equal representation. So I like writing for Sunday Times. I did a, a piece that I really enjoyed called The Seven Ages of Man, which was. I went out on a date with boys of a boy of 17. I know that sounds a little bit um, obscene, but you know it was all very innocent. And then someone of 28, someone of 35, 40. You, you get the idea. Until 80, and um, the only person I actually paid for because the men were too proud to let me pay, even though I was on expenses, was the young boy of 17. We went skateboarding in a park, and then we went to see a surf movie, which was great. Then we had a McDonald's, and then he went home. So, great. Idiot. <laughs> no, I liked that. And then it actually really, I mean, it's, it was sad for me to say, but it, it really went in type. So the 20-year-old was very thrusting and really wanted to kind of get ahead and got his five-year plan worked out and 10-year plan. And then 30-year-old was a little bit more circumspect about it all. Things were not going according to plan. He had been looked over for a promotion and was starting to get a little bit bitter. And then, the, actually the 40-year-old, it was when I was about 40, was the one that I identified with because he had all these plans. And this is what life happens, how life happens to you when you've got all these ideas. It just throws you a googly. So he'd been married and was climbing up the greasy pole and then his marriage split up and you know, this is what happens. This is life. And then I quite liked him, I felt sorry for him, I wasn't going to do anything sexy with him, but um, I went back to his house and then he played some music which was kind of, love will tear us apart <laughs> again, and then, that's you in the corner, that's, and then he started crying, um, <laughs> and then I had to leave, and then the 50-something was my favourite because he had a red sports car, second time around with the, you know, dumped the first wife, he was really on it. And he was going to get himself a super babe, so we went to his club and so on. And then he fell asleep. Uh, <laughs> Sixty-year-old was a bit about I've just had my hip replaced and I'm feeling a little bit ouchy in my shoulder. Uh, Seventy-year-old was about train times. Uh, it takes me twenty minutes to get here, and the taxi driver didn't know where he was going. And then the eighty-year-old was really charming for 10 minutes and then fell asleep. <laughs> so that was one of my favourite pieces to write, I think, just because I saw all human life there. And also going on holiday with Dame Doom, which was lovely. Uh, this is How Do I Get Beach Body Ready? <gasps> i tell you how. You take your body to, to the, the beach, beach. <laughs> and, you're and then you're ready. Yes. <laughs> I graffitied that poster on the tube about a month ago with my young daughter who was deeply embarrassed. I was so infuriated about it, I got my little sharpie and I went, everybody is beach body ready. And I sat back down and I felt quite embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> and then as I got off the tube, two women scuttled to me, she went, oh, I, I, I feel the same way. I, I, I agree, I agree. And then the other club, I agree with you. So it shows you that actually we're all quite annoyed by the fascism that we have to look a particular way for our bodies, but we don't really talk about it. So yeah, beach body ready. So our, so our African Grey is an amazing mimic, so he, he mimicked all, all of the family, but you couldn't quite work out quite what he said, but you could work out our names. So one night we had a friend staying with us, and 
all you could hear. So at night he would go, so, do it, Barbara, Barbara, do it. And my friend thought that my dad had been locked out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> she walked around the whole house in the dark. And there was, Sheena, Barbara, do it. Barbara, Barbara, you're bad. Stop it, you're bad. You're bad. <laughs> It just did the knocking. It, it, any sound effect, like if we went to open the dishwasher, it would go. <laughs> <laughs> and then if my dad went to pour a drink, it would be. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'd go. <laughs> he'd do the cough before he drank. <laughs> and then he'd do the sound. So they are brilliant mimics for every every possible sound. But he did a kind of futtix end babbling. Oh, so sad. some feathers when there would be an argument in the house. You'd get very upset. But, um, I think just lighten up and enjoy the parrot because they're bloody brilliant. Yes. Yeah. I think, yes, you need to get to know the parrot and then you can go round and have a conversation. Is it unusual for my husband to expect sex every day? <laughs> <laughs> Limey, fair light, you got racy. <laughs> well, I think it's not unusual, but it's a little inconsiderate, isn't it? Really? I mean, you know. And my granddad always used to say when I was out of earshot, all men need is a full belly and an empty ball sack. <laughs> get to a certain age perhaps and they might think it's okay to not have sex anymore Eighteen. babies you know let's have a rest it's what okay. age did you say 80 80 80 <laughs> i mean i think you can fall in love and be absolutely turned on by anyone at any age my mum is getting more action than i am <laughs> my mum calls me goes darling he woke me up to take me again. <laughs> Mom, this is too much information. What age is that? 84. <laughs> 84, let's give her a round of applause. Thank you very much. Okay.